Okay, hello London. Okay, that's all right, should we do that again? Hello London. Thank you. All right, this is the Data Engineers AI Survival Guide. So the rise of AI has been staggering. This time two years ago, Gen AI had had niche success and was widely ridiculed for not being very good. And it was easy to understand why this wasn't a threat to the status quo, and it didn't take up much space in people's heads. All of this changed in November of 2022 when ChatGPT 3.5 was released for general use, making the turning point in not just what Gen AI was capable of, but what like the general population's understanding of what Gen AI could actually do. And I don't know why I'm telling you this, because you already know. Your boss already knows, your mum already knows. So I'd put large chunks of money on most companies wanting to incorporate Gen AI or large language models uh, at work, and as those data people, most of this responsibility is falling on you. Now the bad news is that Gen AI is a new beast of machine learning. This isn't some extension of linear regression. No, we need unstructured data, and we need a heck of a lot of it. Um, it's a vastly different pre-processing pipeline, and serving it to end users has to happen in under a second. This is compounded by the fact of the ease of use that online services offer that make, to the uninitiated, make it look oh so simple. But there is some good news. Um, and if we think about our timeline, uh, we can see that this is new to nearly everyone. No one has 10 years experience of enterprise applications of Gen AI. Your average data scientist is probably going to have like maximum 18 months of experience, but in reality, it's probably a lot less. Um, also, a lot of AI is processing um, huge amounts of data and kind of sticking together infrastructure, which means that you, as the data people, um, are about to be very, very useful. This is the Data Engineers AI Survival Guide, where I'm going to show you where your data engineering skills are needed in this new AI landscape. But before we get into that, a bit of an introduction. My name's Holly Smith. I've worked at Databricks for five years. Uh, and apparently, I have some commitment issues that prevent me from working in the same role for more than two years at a time. I've worked on so many customer projects, I have lost count. Um, there are some things that never change, but there are some new challenges that come in with Gen AI. While writing this talk, I had an idea of who would be listening to this. So you. I'm assuming that you are a data person. You work at a smart data team. Um, you are probably known as something like, I don't know, data wizard. Uh, but you have no experience with LLMs. You have some coworkers. Now, you might be lucky. Uh, you might have a few LLM experts to hand. And these tend to come in two flavors. So either those that like, haven't been doing it for very long, so have limited experience putting things in production, or you're working with academics who have loads of papers to their name. So they have no experience putting things in production. And surrounding you, you probably have a lot of eyes. You've got management expectations. You've got the hangers on. You've got the execs. You've got the clipboard brigade. So here is my advice to survive this AI trend and retain that title of data wizard. Firstly. Pick the right project. Or specifically, match the effort to what's actually required. Don't overcomplicate it more than you have to. If the only requirement you have is like, we need to use AI, just use someone else's. <laughs> use Copilot, use Glean, use Perplexity, heck, use Grammarly. There are so many ways that you can benefit from AI without having to build, deploy, and maintain it yourself. Um, now, this is a talk from a Databricks employee. So of course, I'm going to show you a few Databricks things. Um, so in the genre of easy AI, uh, we have things like an AI coding assistant, um, which I have found amazingly sweet for debugging. I will go out on a limb and say it is the best thing out there for Databricks coding. Uh, we've also got this idea of being able to use models within SQL. So if you had like a list of uh, data with kind of customer reviews in it, instead of spending five days researching what open library you're meant to use to condense all of that, uh, you could just put it in SQL and say, with this column, summarize it for me. Great. 
Done, easy peasy. Uh, we've also got AI for BI as well. Uh, and again, this is just kind of plain text saying, here's my data set, make a chart of this versus this, and I'll go ahead and do it for you. Um, and we also have my favorite, which is Genie Spaces. Can I get a quick show of hands? Who here has made a dashboard that gets looked at once and then never looked at again? Oh, yeah, this is the feature for you. You can just set it up with a data set, and instead of making a dashboard each time, you can just like give it to the person, and they can type away and ask in plain English and get the answers out of their data. All right, so there's not really much to do here aside from take the credit. So the next steps are going to involve a deeper understanding of generative AI. So let's do a bit of a recap. Uh, so option zero, you could outsource. That's what we just spoke about. Uh, you could do prompt engineering, so taking an LLM and guiding it towards a specific approach, uh, like a scope or a personality, to generate the kind of answers that you want. Next level down, uh, we've got RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. And I hope this acronym is going to be seared into your brains by the end of today. This is taking an existing model and augmenting it with like company-specific data. Someone else has done the hard work of like, what are words even? Um, and you're just like adding, I don't know, you're like Google Drive to it. Next, we have fine tuning. So this is where we're changing the definition of what words mean. So if you're working in like a medical field, this is probably the kind of thing that you'd be doing. And then finally, the big daddy, pre-training. This is where you are taking a model and training it from scratch. Now, this talk is focused on the data engineering elements of these projects. If you want to learn the nitty gritty of fine tuning, uh, wrong talk, sorry. I'm sure someone else can talk to you about this uh, in, the, in these two days. Lots of people know their stuff here. So let's start off easy with an existing model. If you wanted to take someone else's model and put it into your application, this is completely fine. Um, but here are some things that you might want to think about. So you that might want to think about giving the model a prompt, like you are a helpful support team member who can answer questions about blah, blah. Uh, my favorite example is one of our customers turned my coworker, uh, or turned one of our models into a coworker. Um, <laughs> Advice I've received includes uh, you know, narrowing the scope of what the model can actually do, not just to a specific domain, but also maybe a tone of voice, maybe a geography. Mark what's important. Uh, you can act it, ask it to act with certain personas, um, like not just professional, but cheery and enthusiastic. So don't be surprised if your prompts change over time. Our uh, team recently bought, built a chatbot for a conference. And because of the way people were interacting with it, we actually ended up changing these prompts as the event went on. Uh, uh, and another interesting uh, phenomenon, again, is also the way that users interact with the chatbot. This is sometimes called user drift. Uh, so we also had, already have a few moving parts that we need to keep track of. Um, this leads me into the skills that you as a data person might already have or can pick up moderately easy to these kinds of projects. Things like serving the actual endpoint, sticking the components together, making all of this stuff work. So, Let's look at some diagrams. The first obvious thing you're going to need is like an interface where you're going to be, you know, your users are going to be asking their questions and you'll be storing your prompts. Um, you could dive into the world of web apps if you wanted. We do have Lakehouse apps, which are coming out soon. Uh, um, after that, we also need some serving infrastructure as well. Um, and this is where you've got a few options. You could do the simplest option and just maybe call like an external model service. Um, like chat GPT or whatever and kind of pay per token. You might want to put things like rate limiting in there. Now, maybe you want more control. Uh, you could pick a model of something like Hugging Face if you wanted, uh, which is kind of like GitHub for models. Um, but there's a bit more that you'll need to set up in terms of like some GPUs to do the processing. Um, and you also need to like handle the connections and things like that. Or you could pick a halfway point uh, if you're using Databricks and go for Databricks, found oop, da Databricks Foundation models. Um, and they're optimized for inference. So the response times, the bandwidth, and we do have like, some of the security stuff for you as well. So I've got my web app. Um, I've got my model. Um, and the thing that I probably want to set up last is some monitoring to log the responses that I'm getting. And again, your data skills are going to come in handy here. Slap it all into a pen-only ta table, set up a batch job to monitor. And of course, Databricks has lots of things to help you out here. If this were my first foray into developing or deploying a Gen AI model, maybe I was doing a proof of concept. Like, this is where I'd start. Um, 
just getting into the habit of kind of serving things, maybe just picking like a simple model rather than going for something more advanced and hugging face. I'm not saying you can't ever do it, but this is a good starting point. Um, maybe save some of the customizations for the second epic. All right, so on to RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Uh, this is where you take a model that already exists, you combine it with your own data. And now you can start asking questions like, what is my company's holiday policy? And for me, RAG is a great use case. I know we are at like peak hype cycle for AI right now, but when we are hurled through that trough of disillusionment, um, I genuinely think this is the kind of thing that is going to stand the test of time. So how do we build one of these things? So first, we need to ingest our words. We need to clean our words. We need to split our words. We turn, need to turn the words into numbers, uh, which are vectors, essentially. We need to store these word vectors into a special type of database, um, often called a vector database for serving. Now, so far, this looks a lot like ETL. And don't underestimate how valuable your skills are going to be um, in this kind of work. If you have to guarantee that your AI app is going to be you know, up to date to the nearest five minutes, that's a five minute SLA to churn through all of this data. And if you're a data engineer, that's fine. If you're a data scientist, that's terrifying. <laughs> So this sounds kind of obvious to us, um, but this is really going to solidify that status as a data wizard. We're going to use Spark. We're going to use Delta. We're going to have clusters that are the right size. Uh, we're going to incrementally process things. Um, it's also probably going to be quite ugly, so having things for lineage, like Unity Catalog, um, are going to save you here. If you have sensitive data that needs to be scrubbed, again, Unity Catalog going to get the, um, make sure that the wrong people don't get access to the wrong data. So from there, we do our ETL, and we combine it with something similar to what we had before. We still need this AI front end that we've got here. And now model serving is more than just an endpoint. It has a few extra steps to it that it changes things together. So with the user input, first it's going to look for related content. It's going to bring back those sources of the related documents. Then it's going to go ahead and create that prompt using that, using generic templates um, and the relevant docs. Then it's going to go to your big fat model uh, that someone else created, um, which is going to generate the response. And then, of course, after that, you do want some monitoring. Shameless plug for all the Databricks stuff that we have to help with this. I do want to highlight a few risky areas that might give you a bit of trouble. Uh, in general, you're optimizing for speed of response. Um, and that generally means making more specific compound models rather than going for like the biggest, most smartest model you can find. You want to tune for what it is that you want to do not to solve the world's problems. Um, again, it also means uh, not picking the most complex way to represent numbers. Um, you also might want to look at the way that you're like splitting words with your algorithms in your model. Um, and again, you might have like a different way, different algorithm to search through that kind of flavor of database as well. Um, again, sometimes uh, like one vector database isn't enough, and you need more than one. This is called hybrid search. Um, and if you have access across different documents, uh, I hope you're good with credentials. Um, you're going to have to kind of like authenticate all the way through as well if you need your users to have like specific access to specific documents. Um, so some heads up on some uh, challenges that we've got there. Oh, I don't, all right, fair enough. Uh, OK, and it's at this point that we start ramping up the amount of data that we need to actually make our model. Maybe I want to try and make it an expert in a particular domain, like a programming language. Um, or maybe we want to guide it towards a certain behavior. Whenever I use Gen AI, I am infuriated by its lack of, un of its uncreative usage um, of language. And if I made Hollybot, it would be trained on archaic Britishisms. Um, and the variety of what is supplied and the quality of it can be the difference between a successful project and one that is riddled with fragility and unpredictability. Um, these can start at like tens of thousands of words, but realistically, this is going to go up to a million or even a billion words. For context, all Shakespeare plays combined are about 600,000 words. And who's probably going to be enabling this at scale? That's right. It's you, lovely people. Um, the faster a team can iterate on what a good data set is, the more thought and care can go into what good means. 
I know I talked about Spark earlier, but helping teams find like the Sparky version of their assessment tools, um, either that's something that integrates with Spark or it's something that can be distributed um, across a cluster to run in parallel. So let's take a, a toxicity library like Detoxify. Um, if left to its own devices, it's going to happily sit on the Spark driver um, and do nothing for the worker nodes or just kind of poodle along. But what's needed is data engineering people like you to make it scale, to make it more efficient. In terms of the whole pipeline, um, it's not that different to what we had earlier. We get the data, we do the prep, uh, we make our tokens, you get the starter model, you need some GPUs, uh, let it run for kind of six to 48 hours, um, and then serve it like any other model that we mentioned previously. What is not on here, actually, uh, we are bringing, Databricks is bringing out like an AI uh, fine tuning feature. It turns out lots and lots of people want to do this. We want to be able to kind of minimize the amount of code that people are using to fine tune their own models. So this should get simpler over time. All right, so we're now on to the kind of like big daddy of models. And that is a pre-training, making something from scratch. And this is incredibly hard. And with respect to this lovely smart audience that I have in front of me, like this is not the starter project. This is not the place to start. If you have zero experience building a model, do not start here. There are some surprising challenges that come with things like this. Um, and again, let's look at this from an aspirational perspective in terms of the challenges that you're going to have. One of the first things that people don't often realize is the infrastructure that's available on like AWS or Azure. Uh, it's just not really enough. You have to know someone who has the specific hardware for you to be able to run your model. I kid you not, you have to pick up the phone, you have to meetings, and you have to like manually book out when are you going to borrow this super expensive hardware um, to make your model from scratch. Um, let's also go over some scale considerations as well. Uh, so word counts, they're going to start into the billions. So think a million big, uh, million uh, books worth. Um, and this is where people start hitting the limits of how many words exist about the thing. So for my holly bot of Britishisms, um, I would have to use every book published from the last 10 years and hope they're all relevant. Um, but newer models, they are up to the trillions. Like the UK has not published enough books for this. And now if we have to ingest all of this, clean it, split our words into tokens, get it allocated to the GPUs to do the trading, like the actual model run itself. Like This could take a week to process. So the odds that you can truly iterate are slim to none. Um, generally, you start working on a smaller version of the model, and then you like work up to a much bigger one. One of the less obvious implications of this is that the model is static, and if you don't, you know, you're probably not going to retrain every month or so because that's horrendously expensive. This means once you've done all the hard work, you still probably have to combine it with fine tuning and RAG as well to include newer data. Um, again, if you are interested in kind of doing this, um, Databricks does have a suite of products to help you with this. Now. We can't have a Gen AI talk without talking about the different flavors of operations. There are so many people that say, like, we should make sure, and you know who's going to have to make sure? Everyone in this room. Um, making the model is probably going to be about 30% of the headache. If you are responsible for project or sprint planning or just managing expectations of enthusiastic uh, stakeholders, this section is for you. First of all, DevOps. Uh, please do it. Um, we do have a few things to help you with it. Uh, this is not particularly new, uh, so I'm not going to dwell on this at all. Um, but we've done our DevOps. Let's look at data ops. Um, you're going to have so many versions of data flying around, um, and it's going to be split into two categories. You've got your static data, uh, which is easy to train your model, um, which is kind of harder than it sounds, actually. Um, you also need this kind of interaction with the model as well to keep track of. Um, and again, we've got a few things to look after here. Uh, by the way, MLflow uh, is great out the box uh, for response monitoring. So if you want to see how people are responding, um, it's open source. You can just kind of use it straight off the site. Um, but that's not all, because not only do we have to keep track of our code and our data, we also have to keep the, like, track of which version of which model sits in which data with which environment. Do not underestimate just how much time this is going to take to set up. 
At Databricks, we've got this like big book of ML ops, which I have read multiple times, and I still don't understand it. <laughs> so once you've got this set up, you'll start bumping into ops from other parts of the organization, especially budget holders. In my experience, execs are often very surprised at how expensive these projects are. Um, this is not the time to do 10 projects, like 10 gen AI projects, and see which works best. When Databricks built our own model, DBRX, we spent $10 million on GPUs. Now, I'm not saying that your projects are going to be that expensive, but even if you make something out 1% of the cost, that's still 100 grand. Um, and for you, this is a blessing in disguise. This is going to narrow down what projects you're working on very quickly. And the conversation is going to go something like this. Um, but maybe you do have some budget. And the next thing that you want to consider is security. Now, I'm not a security expert, so this section is a little bit light. But here are some general points to consider in your system. Uh, you want to do things like encryption. Uh, you want to rotate your keys. You want to keep an eye out for things like prompt injection as well. Uh, this is like the source of much hilarity online when someone is able to like jailbreak um, a model to kind of disregard previous instructions and then go ahead and do something else. Uh, we also have arbitrary code execution. Uh, for me, this is the most terrifying. So if your AI assistant can act on your behalf, like send an email, um, you could have a malicious attacker like making it do something on your behalf as well. There is a great paper. Um, here comes the AI worm, which is like the first uh, like injection that someone found about models. A really terrifying read. Uh, we also have this idea of model poisoning as well, and also the unintentional sharing of data. For me, this is two sides of the same coin, like poor data quality. Don't put data in your model that shouldn't be there. And don't automatically include data without checking what it is. Now, it is one thing for me to say this, but if you have a million books worth of data, this is going to take some real creativity to think about all the ways that this can go wrong. And finally, if you're using like a niche third-party model, that could be malicious too. Yay! Um, now, given that nearly everyone is new at this, and security teams included, they might just Google like what's a risk and come back with their wish list. And as an ex-consultant, here is my pro tip. Make recommendations. Prioritize them based on likelihood. Show the estimates of how long it's going to take to do all these implementations. Of course, Databricks does have a few things to make this easier. Given how hot security issues are, internal projects are going to be a lot less of a headache um, than anything kind of public facing. But we are not done yet. What are some legal issues that we might contend with? Uh, so things like storing data that you're not meant to, uh, the legal rights to use the data, NVIDIA. Uh, make sure someone else doesn't hold the copyright. Uh, now, this next category is tricky. And I call it the kind of like what if category of legal concerns. What if our model offers a service for free? What if our model slanders people? What if it does something illegal? What if it makes something illegal? And again, this tends to come from legal teams also being new at this and being terrified they're not going to catch every edge case and they'll end up in hot water. Again, prioritize these for the legal team. I do recommend getting someone senior enough on side that recognizes you need to deliver something and that 18 months of legal reviews is just not viable. You need to deliver something. Now, your project has probably shown halfway across the company now, and someone somewhere will say, but what about the ethics? I'm not immune to this idea that tech is often a new vector to harass people or enforce harmful stereotypes, even as something as shiny as our new work pass headshot supplier. Um, for some reason, it edited women to make them look more work appropriate by adding false eyelashes and making them look more white. And I encourage you all, seriously, as practitioners, to take the time to think how your applications might impact people's lives and make it more unpleasant. Part of this involves rigorous testing. Whenever we build a model, a new model at Databricks, we let thousands of people spend a week bullying it. Um, the other part allows for building out the feedback loops to quickly flag anything um, that is offensive and review it in a timely manner. If you know your team is a bit one-sided when it comes to demographics, by all means, invite fresh perspectives um, to test your headshot app and discuss the implications that you might not have thought of. There are serious concerns. But 
There has been a glut of people wanting to get on the AI trend by like, pontificating about nebulous ideas that have no possible tangible solution until they block any progress. Um, how do you deal with these people? You need to time box, you need to give them an outlet, kind of voice their concerns, you know, make a questionnaire, ask for research, ask for sources. Um, if there's anything legitimate in there, by all means take it seriously. But there will be a lot of what ifing around the ethics side. So with all in mind, let's have a look at some project plans. So at the core of this, I'm hoping that this is seeming a little less daunting than maybe when you first sat down. Getting the data, ingesting it, doing some ETL, cleaning it along the way, I believe in you, you can all do this. When it comes to a modeling approach, I hope you now have enough context to have conversations with your data scientists to articulate what it is you need and how you can be helpful to them. In terms of timelines, you could maybe do this in about, I don't know, a month or two. But let's face it, a proof of concept doesn't have a business impact. So let's look at production. Get a budget, make an arch diagram, start building some LLMOS frameworks simultaneously, show security, show legal, make a model, make an app, build the monitoring, test with users, and go live. I reckon you could do this in six months, nine months, if you may be held up with reviews. Obviously, I have zero understanding of your project and what it is that you're trying to do at the moment, so please take this with a mountain of salt. All right. Again, what can we take from this? Uh, again, I hope this has given you the confidence to have those meaningful AI conversations with the people around at you back in the office tomorrow or on Monday. Don't let the hype fool you. There are plenty of people new at this. These are skills you already have, and they are definitely valuable here. I'm sure you can retain that title of data wizard. All right, I'm Holly Smith. This has been a Data Engineer's AI Survival Guide. Thank you.